The voice is the voice is loud enough. Springburn born, knights were raised, and now Drum Chapel blessed. So there we go. Good to be here uh, this morning. Uh, what a glorious day! Uh, just to to drive over a couple of things. I was hoping uh, my colleague, who's flying up from London today for some work that we're going to be doing this week, uh, might have got to Glasgow Airport in time, uh, but he didn't, and so it's just myself. And uh, also, uh, the other thing I must remind myself of constantly is uh, my father still lives down in Knightswood. And I always just think when I'm coming to Drum Chapel, I'm coming home. The only thing is you guys are about 10 minutes further away from me uh, than where my dad lives. So that just gives Rod, you know, checks his heart's work and all that sort of stuff uh, and do that from there. Uh, let me bring you the greetings of Calderwood Baptist Church in East Colbride. Uh, that's where uh, I've been based for the last 20 years. Uh, you know, the East Colbride uh, sent out uh, all of its Glasgow children, you know, or Glasgow sent out all of its children 60 years ago to East Colbride and exotic places like Glenrothes uh, and Irvine and, uh, you know, these uh, new towns. Uh, and somebody had to go out there as a missionary, so that was my role. And uh, as I say, we bring you the greetings of the church uh, at Calderwood. In a moment, we're going to read John chapter 5. I want to say thank you for those who led us. Uh, in praise and in adoration, uh, because there's a very real sense uh, in which every song that we've sung uh, just flows out of the very passage that I'm going to be preaching in. So I don't know when uh, you guys did that, but we're right on the money uh, in terms of the preaching uh, and the praising uh, of God's name. So bless you uh, for all of that. But let me say one little prayer. I just did a little burden as I came in there was a group of people gathering and I thought, they look like ramblers. Now, I'm praying that I won't ramble, right? But uh, that, uh, they look like ramblers. And then I saw the wee heads all bobbing up and got up into the hills. So I just God put a burden in my heart to pray for them. So let's pray for them this morning. Gracious Father, we do want to pray for the, the ramblers, whether local or from uh, different places who are heading out uh, in such a beautiful November morning into your creation. And Father, we pray for them. Uh, they may have gathered uh, at a place of remembrance. They may have gathered at a place of worship. But they're heading out this morning, uh, not intending to praise or to call out to you. Uh, and Father, we know that's exactly where we were until you in your grace and in your mercy drew us to yourself, placed within our hearts and our lives a desire to worship and to honor and to glorify you. And Father, we pray today for that uh, group of, of ramblers that in the, the beauty of your creation, you might just by your spirit convict one or two uh, of the one who made this world that this morning they want to enjoy, that you might uh, even uh, in the midst of walking uh, through a beautiful uh, environment this morning, Speak to them of who you are and of their need of you. Father, we pray that you be at work for your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you have your Bible, I'm going to encourage you uh, to look at John uh, chapter 5. Uh, we're going to read, uh, really the focus uh, is on uh, 21, 2, 3, 4 particularly verse 24, but I'm going to start reading at verse 18 and finish at verse 30. John chapter 5, uh, verses 18 uh, through 30. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father making himself equal with God. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life 
to whom he will. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Amen. And we pray that God would speak to us this morning uh, as we uh, look into his word. You know, it's a wonderful privilege to be with you. I, I tend to go walking, but I'm conscious of the fact that this uh, is also being transmitted. So I'm going to look to the back, and if I'm going to a camera shot, just shout, and I'll come back in, right? Uh, but that's a warning uh, for those uh, who, who are watching with us uh, this morning. John chapter 5. Uh, I, I'm, I, I love uh, God's Word, and I'm a, a great lover of John's Gospel. I think I had the privilege uh, a few weeks back of being here in the evening to share a little bit about how we use the Word one-to-one, -one, how we open up John's Gospel with unbelievers, how we might make much of Jesus uh, just by speaking His Word into people's hearts and lives. And I said at the time that John uh, has got three great themes that run uh, through all of his writings. He, he talks about the love of God. Uh, he talks about the light. Uh, and of course, Jesus himself in John's gospel calls himself, I am the light of the world, right? Uh, and so there we find what it is to know God uh, in Jesus Christ and to belong to God through Jesus Christ and to glorify God uh, in the light of all that he has revealed in himself. And his other great theme, of course, is love and light and life. And whenever John speaks about life, he's always, always, always talking about eternal life, right? When John speaks about life, it's life that never ends, right? And that, you know, if, if that doesn't put a smile on your face now, right, you're going to be shocked come the day, right? Uh, but whenever John speaks about eternal life, uh, you know, every time he mentions that word life, he's speaking uh, about eternal life. Now, let's get the context here, because uh, Jesus uh, had just healed a man at the pool at Bethesda, a man who for 38 years had been completely paralyzed, unable to move. He, he was, uh, in everything that Jesus was doing, in the physical healing and wholeness of that man, he was also saying, I am the one who is going to bring spiritual healing, spiritual wholeness, spiritual life, spiritual vitality to all who by faith will put their trust in me, right? And so he just healed a man, 38 years, an invalid, waiting in hope that there might just be an answer. Do you not find that we live in a world where people looking at all the wars and the rumors of wars, where people looking at all the rebellion and protest against any kind of authority. We live in a world where people are longing for some hope that would transform the whole situation. And the problem is they're longing, but they're not looking. They're hoping, but they're not searching. And 
you know, th their eyes and their ears and their heart and their whole being is closed to the revelation of the God who made them and who in Christ Jesus can absolutely transform them. And that's the reality of our world, right? Into the midst of that, whenever Jesus said, truly, truly, right, what he was really saying is, set up, take note, pay attention, right? I didn't apply myself all that well at school, right? Uh, but I kind of knew the rules, right? When the teacher said, in various ways, be quiet, settle, and eventually, because she was teaching a class that would do none of those things, she said, shut up! <laughs> what she meant was, listen, this is really important. And whenever Jesus, uh, in John's gospel, would say, truly, truly, he was saying to folks, sit up, pay attention, listen. This part's critical. This part's crucial. We need to get this. We need to hold on to this. We need to put this into practice. That's what he's saying, right? Every time he says, truly, truly. So what happens? He, he heals this man, 38 years in that situation. He does it on a Sabbath. Oh, boy. Right? He does it on the Sabbath. It's interesting. The Jewish religious leaders who were so protective of the Sabbath could not see that in actual fact Jesus loved the law, loved everything God had spoken. In actual fact, he and himself was the fulfillment of it. Right? It was about freedom. It was about deliverance. It was about enabling people to become everything that God in Christ longs that each one of us might become if we by faith would respond to him. And so the reality is Jesus, uh, the one who is the fulfillment of the law, he's done it on a Sabbath. But not only has he done that, in his words and in his actions, and they always work together, the words and actions of Jesus, in both of those things, they were starting to be dawning on them time and time again. He's claiming to be the Messiah. He's claiming to be God. He's claiming to be the long-promised one. You know the glorious truth about the gospel? The glorious truth about the gospel is that the gospel was promised for hundreds of years before Jesus Christ came on earth, right? He's the fulfillment of the promise that God has made. That's who Jesus is. The fulfillment of the promise that God has made, right? And so along comes Jesus the fulfillment of the promise that God has made. God incarnate. We're going to celebrate that shortly, aren't we, right? Uh, you know, uh, I, I just love that. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We're moving there. It's Christmas, right? Uh, you know, some people sit there and think, oh, don't give us Christmas. I'm saying, give us Christmas. We need Christmas, right? So the reality is, you know, God incarnate, right? Uh, and Jesus is the fulfillment uh, of all that's been spoken, the long promises of God. And here's the thing, he's standing before them, and every word he speaks, and every work that he performs, is saying to them, I am the Messiah. I am the Savior. I am God. But mankind doesn't like that. Mankind by nature rebels against that. Mankind by nature wants to go his own way. Mankind by nature, if truth be told, wants to be his own God. You know, when you look at all these rebellions against any kind of authority, it's basically because I want to be in charge. I want to be the authority. Man wants to be his own authority. The truth is, before God, you can't. No one can. There is only one person who's in control. There is only one person who's in charge. There is only one God, and he is sovereign. And there are those that God in His grace just opens our eyes and opens our hearts and opens our lives to see this and to put their trust in Him and to crown Him. You know the proclamation and the confession of faith that every Christian has? Jesus Christ is Lord. But here's the problem. The problem is that even sometimes as followers of Christ, we like to say, well, Jesus Christ is Lord. All right? But we kind of like to sort of quantify that a little bit and sort of, you know, make a few wee tweaks and we say he's Lord, but 
I don't particularly want him to be Lord of this particular part of my life. And I don't particularly agree with him when he says this. And even you find people professing Jesus Christ who still want to say, well, you know, I believe in who Jesus is and my trust is in Jesus. And he is my Lord, but he's no Lord when it comes to these things. My friend, Jesus Christ is Lord of absolutely everything. And if you've got an issue with one or two things that he said or one or two things that he's calling us to and the holy standard of life that God ordains for mankind, then the problem's with you and your heart. It's not with who he is because he is Lord. And here's the problem for these Jewish religious leaders who were uh, deciding among themselves that they were going to kill him. They were going to kill him because he was claiming to be equal with God and they were going to kill him uh, you know, because he, he was breaking the Sabbath. Sometimes you kind of want to take my side and say, think about what you've just said. You want to kill him because he's claiming to be God. Maybe you need to have a good look at who he is. But there's a blindness in in the heart of man that will not see. Uh, And so that's what they want to do uh, to Jesus. But here's the problem with Jesus. The problem with Jesus is he's factual. He's true. The miracles happened. The words were real. You know the problem with facts? They're so stubborn. They don't go away. That's the issue, isn't it? I mean, facts, they're just like so stubborn. You know? It's like, you know, when somebody, you know, does something and it's all on the, the multitude of CCTV cameras that are there, right? And it's like, no, no, I didn't do it. That looks awful like you. You got a twin brother or some doppelganger, or is that really you? You're still wearing the same shirt, right? They don't go away. That's facts, isn't it? They're stubborn. Stubborn little things, you know? I mean, to learn to say Jesus Christ uh, is Lord in every area of life. So Jesus, uh, you know, speaking, uh, says, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. And many people have said, you know, this is a little bit like The Apprentice, you know. Uh, but in actual fact, we've got to remember that we can't actually uh, divide God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit in that way. But the reality is we know what he's saying, right? God uh, the Father, Christ the Son, God the Holy Spirit, everything they do is in perfect harmony and the perfect fulfillment of the plan and purpose of God. Uh, and so uh, he, 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 he kind of draws attention to why he's doing what he's doing. It says, for the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing and greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. So that you may marvel. Now, here's the interesting thing. In the context of John chapter 5, flowing out of the, you know, the healing of the man who for 38 years had been paralyzed, the healing of that man, there are two little... Uh, I'm saying little, Uh, there are two incredible truths in John chapter 5 that you and I can marvel at, right? And here's the first one. The first one is this, Jesus raises the dead. Now, you've got to marvel at that, and I'm going to show you exactly why in a minute or two, right? So, Jesus raises the dead. Uh, You know, he he says, you know, he's going to do greater works so that you can marvel. And here's the second one, Jesus is judge. Those are great works. Those are amazing works, right? Look, look at the number of times we see this, even in our little passage, our little section, right? Verse 21, For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. Right? That's what it says, verse 21. Uh, look on uh, a, a little bit uh, further. Truly, truly, I say to you, however, here's my word and believes him who sent me his eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. It is again. Uh, Then then you read on a little bit. Verse 25, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead 
will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. All right, then you read on uh, a little bit further, verse 28. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. I'll come back to the judgment part in a minute or two. But here, in the context of John chapter 5, right, Jesus is teaching us you're going to see some incredible things that will cause you to marvel. And the first is, I raise the dead. I raise the dead. My friends, that is just incredible. <laughs> because the majority of human beings, even despite the fact that many try with a kind of callous atheism, you know, to kind of say, yeah, I'm not afraid of dying. In here, liars. Liars. Sons of the devil, the father of liars. Because the reality is death entered our world because of that arrogant, atheistic rebellion, I will be king, attitude. And you and I are all part of that. You know, we don't stand there and point the finger. You and I would have done the exact same thing. Humanity rebelled against its God. And death entered the world. You know, death always affects us. It always affects us. Death of a loved one is so hard to bear. Whenever we witness the death of a child, it's so hard to bear. A young person. Always hard to bear. It was hard to bear for Jesus. We need to understand that. We've got one who can empathize and sympathize with us in, you know, the heartbreak of sorrow. Man of sorrows, what a name. When Jesus, you know, saw the morning and came to the tomb of his dear friend Lazarus, it tells us he wept. And he wept not only over the loss of a friend, but actually over the the, the depth of the destruction and devastation and horror that mankind's rebellion against God has brought to our world. It's what he's weeping over. It's what we should weep over. That we have to walk through these times. Recent days I've lost two good friends. Uh, and one of them was a lovely uh, Christian man, an incredible witness. And uh, he, he'd lived with cancer. Uh, he, it's funny, some people say, he's been dying of cancer for 10 years. He was just like, no, I'm living with cancer, right? I used to have a, a wee lady in my church in East Kilbride, and she used to say, I've got the big C. And people would go, oh, and start showing something. She said, oh, no, no, she says, the big C is Christ. <laughs> I've also got the wee C. She says, the wee C is cancer. The wee C is cancer. I remember the late Dr. Jeffrey Grogan, who was a great mentor in my life, when he was told by the consultant that uh, they could do no, for, no more for him. And the young consultant looked at him and he said, you know, you realize now that uh, this is terminal. This is permanent. And the great doctor just looked at me and said, I understand why you're saying that. He says, but I want you to know something. This is just temporary. This is just temporary. My friend, that's, that's the heart of the believer. We know that death is just temporary. We know that Jesus Christ, we talk about the marvel, right, has come to raise the dead. Every time you look at John's gospel, you often find that every time he did a miracle, he would then unpack the miracle and illustrate, or else he'd teach and then he'd, he'd do a miracle to illustrate what he just taught, right? And so it's incredible. You fast forward a few pages here, and some people are sort of still weighing all this up, and you get to the actual resurrection of Lazarus. You know what I love about Lazarus, the raising of Lazarus from the dead? You know, we're in John 5 now, we're in John 11. What I love about the raising of Lazarus from the dead is this, that when Jesus went into a graveyard, 
he was very specific. Right? He said, Lazarus, come out. My friends, there's a reason for that. If Jesus had just said, come up, come out, the whole graveyard would have got up. That's the authority of Jesus, right? So when Jesus raises somebody from the dead, he's got to be specific, right? Because if he says, get up, the graveyard's moving. This is like something out of Michael Jackson's thriller, right? If Jesus says, come up, right? The reality is he said, Lazarus, because he's got the power to raise the dead. And our hope, in the one who says, I am the resurrection and the life, he who believes in me, even though he die, yet shall he live, is sure and certain. Because Jesus has been given all power uh, to raise the dead. But he's not only been given all power to raise the dead. My friend, some people might think, you know, I can die without Christ. I've got news for you. You can die without Christ, but he'll raise you. And you'll stand before him. And every single person will stand before Jesus Christ. And they'll stand before him as judge. And he judges the living and the dead. So whether we're alive at the time or whether we've been dead and he brings us to that judgment seat, he'll judge the living and the dead. And it tells us that to those who have done good, and that's not just about our good works, how do you do good? Here's how you do good. You respond to the conviction of sin that God the Holy Spirit brings about in your life. You respond to the conviction of your need of Jesus Christ. You respond to the truth about who Jesus is and that only in him is the forgiveness of sins. You respond and you confess faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. And when we do that, we're doing good, right? The goodness is not in us. The goodness is in believing and the goodness of God to us. The goodness and kindness of God to us. That's where the goodness is, right? So those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. When God separates the sheep and the goats. When God has a heaven for all those who get faith in him and a hell for those who reject him. That's the reality of biblical truth. And Jesus says, you're going to see these great works that I'm going to do. Now, my friend, that's what it is to be a born-again, professing believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are those who've got eternal life, and we are those who are going to escape the judgment that ends up with us being condemned and separated from God for all eternity. Now, that doesn't put a smile on your face. That doesn't cause us to lift our eyes above the suffering. And my friend, uh, who was dying of cancer, <laughs> he used his favorite text, was, uh, his favorite psalm was Psalm 23. And he used to say, John, he says, when it says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I want you to know something. He says, God doesn't build a bypass around that valley. God takes you right through it. But he goes with you goes with you. And so Jesus says, for as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. Some people get bent out of shape with this. You know, God gives life. Right? Because even, even in coming to faith, some of us want it to be about us. I choose to follow Jesus. I have decided. In actual fact, God in his grace is opening your eyes. You know something? It's got to be that way. For grace to be grace, it's got to be all of God. The minute you and I get our hands on it, oh. you know, in fact, the minute you and I get our hands on most things, oh, right? right? But the reality is, it's all of grace, right? But God works in this wonderful way. Now, that doesn't mean that you and I sit back and do nothing. It doesn't mean that at all. In actual fact, God's chosen way of speaking his message of grace, his message of salvation, and offering that freely to the whosoever, is through you and I. Through you and I. I have a conversation with God that said, God, I don't get why you trust us with this. I think sometimes God probably says, you'll never get that, right? <laughs> but he does. That's what he does, my friends. So look what he says there in verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word 
and believes him who sent me has eternal life. They do not come into judgment, but they pass from death to life. Now, before I was a believer, I was dead in my sin. That's how the Bible describes it, dead in your sin. That's why you and I can't actually do anything, because the dead can't do anything, right? But Jesus has got power over death, and so what he does is he raises the dead. That's the good news of the gospel, right? That's why... The promise is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. That's why the words and works are all pointing and saying to us, you can believe this, you can trust this, Jesus is who he said he is. You can put all your faith in him, all your hope in him, all your trust in him. He will not let you down. Right? That's what it says. And the good news is that he raises the dead. So that means when we're dead in our sin, Jesus can lift us up. Dead in sin, he can lift us up and now we stand righteous in Christ. Not in our righteousness, but in the righteousness of God, right? Uh, And so he looks at us through Jesus Christ, and hallelujah, he sees us as his own. We don't come into judgment. Why? Because we'll pass from death to life. That's a wonderful little track you can follow in Romans, you know, where it goes, you know, sinner condemned, but then set free, and now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? Right? beautiful little trajectory there uh, in Paul's letter to the Romans, right? But truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word, well, my friends, this is, this is what I want to encourage you to, right? I didn't come a few weeks back to train, you know, somebody in using the word one-to-one there. I didn't encourage Rod to get copies of the word one-to-one and tell people to download the app in order that you can just read that for yourself. Because God's way of reaching others is through us, Right? And you and I have got family, and you and I have got friends, you and I have got neighbors, and you and I have got acquaintances, you and I have got people that a sovereign God has uniquely put in our life, and their greatest need is to hear the word. And you and I are just called not. See, this is the thing I love about Jesus. He doesn't look and say, I'm looking for all those with ability. He doesn't. He actually says, I'm just looking for those that are available. That's what Jesus does. I'm looking for those that are available. <laughs> He's looking for our availability, not our ability. (laughs) And and what he does is when he sees us with a bit of availability, right? what he does is he enables us just to sow the seed of his word. That's what we do with the word one-to-one. We actually just sow the seed of the word of God in a person's life. We don't know whether they're going to come to faith right there in the whole process of reading. Often they do. But as we sow the seed of the word of God in a person's life, and then they start coming around the church, or they've already been coming around the church, and they're hearing the word being explained uh, and unpacked, what's happening is they're hearing the word of God. And with the hearing of the word of God comes conviction of sin. And with the hearing of the word of God comes the good news of the gospel. And with the hearing of the word of God comes that place where people throw themselves in the grace and mercy of Christ. That's what happens. Friends, God uses you and I to just speak his word into a person's life. Sometimes we think, oh, what am I going to say? Speak his word. His word is powerful. And get engaged with the word one to one that you're seeking to do uh, here uh, in the church at Drum Chapel. Because when people hear and believe, then God grants to them eternal life. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that absolutely beautiful what God longs to give for all those who will put their trust in him? Look what it says, just the little verse before it, 23, and I'm just about to close, right? That all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. You see, the reason we do all of this is that we might glorify God. You know, I, I love that little, uh, you know, note in the Westminster Confession of Faith. What is the chief end? What is the chief aim of man? To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Isn't that incredible? To glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. How do we glorify God? Well, Jesus, in the context of speaking about His own authority, in these words where He's going, truly, truly, I say to you, right? Truly, truly, I say to you, what he's saying is that if you and I haven't heard the Word of God and believed the Word of God, right, first and foremost, our salvation itself glorifies God. 
But then what he wants to do is he wants to use you and I to speak his word to other people. And as we share him with others, we glorify him. That's what, that's what happens. Some people say that we should share our faith because, you know, because of the, the eternal destiny of the lost. I don't think that's the best motivator. I think we feel overwhelmed with that. But when we hear somebody say, share your faith because it glorifies God. I find that motivates me better. I want to glorify God. Therefore, I want to share my faith. Right? Share our faith. Because we want to glorify God. Well, one other little truly, truly. Verse 26, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Now, there was a 38 years paralyzed man leaping about somewhere in the background and all this, right? Uh, because he'd heard the words of Jesus and now he was living like he'd never lived before, right? Uh, and that's you and I. That's you and I's story, right? Ever since we heard the words of life, You know one of the great things about John chapter 5? Jesus could look back and say, it's all been pointing to me. Jesus could be right and say, I am the son of man. I am the one that will raise the dead. I am the one that will judge the world. The facts are stubborn. Those who hear and those who believe, I will raise them up to eternal life. And here's the incredible thing is that Jesus, as if all of it had already happened, was looking way ahead into the future uh, to the end of all things, to the culmination of everything. And he's looking at it, saying, it's as good as happened. It's as good as happened. Right? And sometimes we sort of sit there thinking, you know, heaven, the future, what will it look like? Jesus says, let me tell you, <laughs> you'll be raised to be with me. It's as good as happened. <laughs> sometimes we get caught up and fearful about that. And he says, it's as good as happened. That's as good as happened as all the promises, as all that's going on right now in the context of the passage. I'm the same yesterday, today, forever. Isn't that incredible? That's the truth of what we believe. That's the truth of our salvation. That's why we can sing, oh, for a thousand tongues, to sing my great Redeemer's praise. Because it's good as happened. <laughs> a joy. So when Jesus says, truly, 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 shut up. Pay attention. Pay attention and do what he says. Why? Because you'll find yourself in a beautiful place. It's called the will of God called the will of God. Just being who he wants you to be, doing what he wants you to do, living as he would like you to live, honoring and glorifying him. Psalm 115 verse 1, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and faithfulness. Let me pray, and then we're going to move towards a time of, of communion. Our gracious Father, we thank you for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. We thank you that in your call upon our lives, you glorify your name. We thank you, Lord God, that in your plan and purpose, you call us to hear and to believe and to put all our trust in you. We thank you that you raise us from the dead, the death of our sin, into the wonderful, glorious truth of the good news of the gospel. We thank you, Lord our God, that your judgment, which should have fallen upon us, is turned away because of the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we today would make ourselves available to be those who would speak your word to others that they might hear, that they might believe. And Father, may it be so, not to us, 
but to your name be all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.